So thank you, thank you, Gary. Uh, you're right, this is a, a slightly different talk than the ones I'm used to giving. It, it is much more of a sort of personal reflections about life in a knowledge working company, including because I couldn't resist a few reflections about where the technology is taking all of us who do knowledge work. So, thank you. Thanks. Um, so one of the things that you sometimes hear people say is, may you live in interesting times. And I've been told that that's an ancient Chinese curse. And I don't know if that's true or not, but it deserves to be true. Because interesting times are full of opportunity, but they're also full of challenges. So Gary mentioned the, the COVID crisis we were going through. But I think it's an interesting question for us about what knowledge work means in the age of interesting times. So knowledge work has been in flux as, as, a, as a concept for a long time, right? You know, it was defined back in 1959 uh, in, uh, in these uh, pre-computer era, really. It's interesting to think, what was knowledge work like in 1959, 1960, right? So in some sense, it was the library in many ways, but things have changed, right? Because now we're all working from home and this might look like where you work. So what does knowledge work mean when we're all working in a different place? Think about this. Two years ago, we were all placed into a 50 million person unconsented experimental condition. You didn't give consent, did you? And yet we're all now working in, a, in an environment like this. So we've got this uh, interesting question. So what is knowledge work now? So let me tell you my definition of it is people it's workers whose main knowledge, main capital is knowledge. It's the stuff for which we deal, right? It's the information spaces, programmers, physicists, architects, physicians, editors, all of that stuff. And the stuff of doing knowledge work is manipulating knowledge using your cognitive skills and whatever tools and applications and information sets that you have, writ large, right? It could be a database, it could be a CSV, it could be a text file, it could be books on the shelf, it could be other people as knowledge resources. I mean it broadly, right? So Peter Drucker, as I said, mentioned, came up with this idea about knowledge work in, in 59, and then said the most valuable asset of the 21st century institution are the people, its knowledge workers, and what they're, produ what they're producing. So how do we work? So classically, knowledge work in Silicon Valley, you have this image of the lone programmer sitting and eating flat food and typing very quickly. But the reality is, in places where I work, it's often like this. It's small groups working together. And sure, they break off and they do their individual work. But there's a huge amount of coordination. If you've ever worked on a software team, you know that's true. Right? You need to write that module today. Right, kind of thing. And it's going to do what? What are the parameters? What are the arguments? How is that library going to work? And, and so we shifted into a model where we're all trying to work like this now. And it's an interesting shift. What gets lost in this translation? So remote workers have been around for quite a while. My colleague, Tom, Tom Erickson uh, at IBM, worked with me at Apple remotely in the 90s which was an interesting thing, right? Because that meant telephone conferences, right? It was an interesting time. And so we learned a lot by talking with Tom, who's a very reflective person about what it meant to work remotely. And one of the things you learn from that experience is how much of the stuff leading up to the meeting and after the meeting is important. Context setting, mutual awareness, all that stuff that doesn't actually show up on the spreadsheet anywhere. So when you've got a 30 minute meeting from nine to 9.30, what happens at 8.45 matters. What happens at 9.45 matters, but it's not part of the meeting and you get locked out because you're not part of the before and after conversation. That was an interesting, interesting finding, but the world was not kind to remote workers. Remember back, to, back in 19, uh, 2013, Marissa Meyer, and I'm picking on her slightly, uh, she's a friend, but she was the CEO of Yahoo at the time. And she said, we need to be one Yahoo and we need to be physically together. She banned remote work. 
Now, a little bit later at IBM, remote work, when I was at IBM in 2000, remote work was still a rarity. It was kind of a, yeah, if you're a very special person, we'll let you work remotely, but no, it's not a thing. And then, as I said, all of a sudden the world changed and we have to figure out what new kinds of work are. So what I wanna talk about today is really um, a few things. I'm gonna talk about the culture. Gary asked me to talk about the culture. So I have permission, right? But because it's knowledge work in the Valley, we talk about hacking the culture. It's an artifact. It's a thing we consciously or unconsciously create. Memo, don't be the unconscious creator of an informal culture. You wanna think about these things. So I'm gonna talk about some myths we tell and ways we talk about means, uh, what the language we use are and, and how that affects the way we think about ourselves. So here's the first big myth that you probably have heard about, certainly about Google, right? We do moonshots, right? We've got Google X, which is, that's their business. That's their logo, moonshot factory, right? Now think about that for a second because the reality is, this is why it's a myth, the reality is nobody does moonshots the way you conceive of them. This is an illusion. So brilliant piece uh, by one of our engineers, Luis Barroso, um, wrote about roof shots. Not moonshots, but roof shots. The way you get to the moon is not by doing one project that you hit the go button and you launch a rocket to the moon. You shoot for the first roof. And then you do another roof and another roof. And eventually you can keep aggregating and creating all that knowledge and skill and technology so that you can do basically bootstrapping, roof shot bootstrapping, right? So a fundamental skill for knowledge work is how to break a huge project down into attainable sub steps. And it's not always obvious. That's why research exists. That's why I have a job is to say, here's our audacious goal, but the reality is what we're gonna do is more like this, right? The moonshot conception, the moonshot myth is you start here in Q1 and three years later, you show, shoot to the moon. You ship everything. But the reality is we do it incrementally because think about it this way. If you do nothing but double your productivity from Q1 to Q, you know, to next year, to next year, to next year, that's kind of where you get by doubling. We all know but doubling is a good thing, right? You want to know what's better? Compound interest. <laughs> because if you get 30% improvement per quarter rather than 100% improvement per year, that's where you end up. And you've got successes over here that you can talk about. So an enormous part of knowledge work is understanding the path from where you're going to the moon. I understand there's space between here and there, but you know, go with me. So what we do is roof shots. So that's a myth. So you might see, you know, PR from Google about projects like this. This is Loon, and it's a moonshot project where we built these big balloons and then uh, flew platforms like that to do regional, country-level Wi-Fi from 50,000 feet. And it's a crazy project. That's part of the reason it's called Loon, right? It's a crazy project because it involves launching networks of balloons, high altitude balloons that would then form mesh networks. How do you steer a balloon? Answer, different altitudes of air travel in different directions. So as you're passing through the air, you gather data and translate that into underlying vector models. So you know how to go from point A to point B. And if you launch enough balloons, they cover the planet and all of a sudden, you've got Starlink. No, no, I didn't say that. Um, <laughs> but you get the idea, right? Um, here's another one. This is another uh, project that has been um, uh, ended. This is Makani. It was a wind power project, a moonshot project from X, which started with the observation, if you're kite surfing, like one of our founders would be, kite surfing on the beach, that's a lot of power there in the sail. So maybe we could turn that into a wing that flies up and down and generates power. The answer is yes, you can. And you do a lot of roof shots and you end up with this Rube Goldberg device that launches when this giant winch and flies up into the Hawaiian sky and does figure eights, generating lots and lots of power. 
But the end of the, the project was because they couldn't produce it at reasonable cost. Huge amounts of technology, great innovation, beautiful inventions. There's a bunch of patents that fell out of this and nobody's gonna make power like this. It's, it's crazy. Another myth was that we just generated self-driving cars from nothing. But if you watch the saga, right? It's been a long process. It's one of those technologies that's always five years out. It will continue to be five years out for all kinds of interesting reasons. This is a, a we produce a few hundred of these uh, self-driving cars, little electric cars um, that have no steering wheel. You just get in them and trust. You don't think of moonshots as being a faith-based enterprise, but they are. That's kind of the way this works. But that's by doing this incremental work is how you get to these interesting underlying models and systems that can do deep analysis of complex situations and give you something interesting to do. And my last project here, what I don't think anybody has ever heard of this, is the glucose sensing contact lens. So this is a, a product of one of our research groups that basically made a contact lens with a whole Wi-Fi system in it to sense the glucose levels in your tear ducts. So your contact lens is floating on a layer of tears. Let's build a little sensor in there. And if you're diabetic, this is great. Right? You don't have to stick your stuff anymore. It's constant read. Every, every couple of seconds, you get a new update. I don't know if we're going to ship this or not. Right? It's in product, but in, in discussion. Right now. So that's one category of myth, is the, is the moonshot myth. Another interesting category, well, let me back up a second. The moonshot, however, to Gary's interesting question at the beginning is, how do you keep people motivated? You give them audacious goals. If you want to sail around the world, you don't give people the task of building a ship. You talk about the mystery of the ocean. You give them a moonshot. You give them an odyssey. Another really common myth that you'll hear is the myth of instant success. And so video conferencing seems like a good example because video conferencing has been around a long time, basically my entire life. 1960 was the first demonstration of video conference. Audio over a phone channel, video by a dedicated line. We then saw just a couple of years later, it appeared in 2001 at Space Odyssey. I saw it when it came out, right? And that was, you know, we saw that. And for most people, that's the first time they'd ever thought about video conferencing from space. But of course, that same year was the mother of all demos. Do people remember this? You know this? How many people know about the mother of all demos? If not, go to YouTube, type Mother of All Demos, and watch it, because you will be astounded at how much stuff was demonstrated. For example, the very first hypertech system was actually NLS 1968. Much, much, much precursor to the web. But as you see here, there's integrated video. This is live video, and the demonstration actually shows that. We now think of it as being a oh, well, of course. In 1968, this was not a course. This is a huge technology lift. 68, 92 CUCMU was the first time people could actually get this going on their computer easily. Anybody use CUCMU? A couple of people. It was very clunky. But you know, the other thing for UI people is look at all the interface goo on here. The Chrome widgets and all the UI stuff is staggering. It's almost a third, a third of the page. Now, of course, we live in a, a more modern world. In 2000s, you know, we had companies like uh, Telerus uh, pop up and you would have these big sophisticated conference room video settings. And of course, it was the 2010s before it became something we all had. We started living in the world of video conferencing. But it wasn't as widely used as in 2020. All of a sudden, all the video com uh, communication companies went through the roof, Zoom, See, uh, uh, Blue Gene, uh, WebEx, all these kinds of platforms. You know. So it's one of those things where you think that these things arise suddenly. No, no, no. They've been around for a long time. As, as a famous science fiction writer once said, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed yet. And that's kind of deeply true. So speaking of science fiction, one of the other myths we talk about a lot is uh, the myth of tech transfer. As Gary mentioned, I, I worked at Xerox Park uh, beginning of my career, and I know about tech transfer. I know a lot of negative examples of tech transfer. 
So if you don't know, this is Arx Park, Silicon Valley. So the canonical Silicon Valley research lab. Um, among other things, we invented laser printers, Ethernet, page description languages. So a couple of guys got disaffected from uh, trying to ship technology at, at Xerox. So they founded Adobe, you've probably heard of them. So that was all invented at Park. In fact, there are books written about this, right? Bombing the Future, how we invented the personal computer. A whole separate story, I'll tell you over coffee. Um, but one of the ideas that came out of Park was this notion of a Dynabook. So Alan Kay is most famous for saying, um, just invent the future. Don't talk about it, just invent it. So in 1968, 1986 rather, he drew this in one of his papers, a tablet computer. With, you notice it's got a keyboard on it. Think about that, it's got a keyboard on it. Right? Don't think about Blackberries for a moment, just think about tablet computers with, with a keyboard. So um, I was there at the time and we talked about this a lot. I was like, oh, this would be great to do, but how do we do it? And so eventually I gave up and I went to Apple. Um, and I was working at Apple, this is Advanced Technology Group, their research group. And that was my office, it was great. Uh, it was a, uh, it's great to see the movies and see my office. <laughs> It's a weird world, right? Where your friends get into movies about technology failures, but that's a separate. Um, <clears throat> so I was there and in 1995, uh, my research group, we prototyped this thing. Uh, this is actually, I still have this actually. It's a, a multi-touch uh, single tablet display with integrated handle, camera, Wi-Fi. You've probably heard of something like this. Um, so what happened was um, in 95, I, I was Steve Jobs had come back at that time. I went to Steve and said, Steve, the future is tablet computing. He looked at this and goes, that's the stupidest thing I've ever seen. Get out of my office. OK, yes, sir. Um, so I got disaffected by that. And so I, I then left in, in uh, 1999. We were in a startup company. A bunch of us did a startup to do this device, right? Um, <clears throat> This is 1999. So uh, this is totally funded by Xerox with spin out funding. So we had a few million bucks to play with the classic startup situation. We had a moonshot goal, build a tablet computer. And then Xerox in their year end review said, we don't make hardware, what are we doing? You're crazy, we're gonna sell you. So they sold us the whole company to Microsoft. And this became the uh, reference platform for the Microsoft tablet. So, uh, ironically, or interestingly, oddly enough, a couple of years later, this was launched. And I'm sure Steve does not remember talking to me <laughs> at all, right? Uh, but I was sitting at home watching this and thought, oh, how interesting, <laughs> right? So one of the things about being in a knowledge working environment in a design culture in Silicon Valley is that there are many paths to success. There are many paths to ship this is one being unacknowledged or being you know forgotten in history is you know it's just the way it works i'm not upset about that it's just the way it works but it's one of the myths that you go from zero to 100 very quickly so for example people remember this the macintosh as being well partly lifted from xerox park but that's a separate story um but just appearing kind of full-blown you know venus from the head of zeus in 1984 not so fast, right? There was a whole history of the Alto and the systems, the star systems at Xerox. But even more importantly to this story, in the year before Lisa came out, anybody remember Lisa? Well, the CS people do, right? Nobody else remembers Lisa. It was an awesome computer, actually. But it preceded the Mac and in many ways. It was tilling the ground so that when the Mac comes out, people go, oh yeah, I know what a personal computer is, right? So here's another story to tell you about this, about instant success. So you've probably all used graphing calculators, right? Type in an expression, get it, the whole thing. You probably used one or your kids use one in, in school. Well, um, Ron was one of uh, people working at uh, Apple ATG at the time, the advanced technology group. And he started working on the graphing calculator in 85. He, the project was canceled, canceled eight years later. He'd been laboring away to get it to work. Eight years later, 
And the interesting untold story is that it was canceled, but he didn't stop working on it. In fact, he kept sneaking into the building and working on it. Uh, and then finally, some product manager said, oh, this is awesome, let's ship it. It looked like an instant success. It was based on years and years and years of work by Ron and his team. So there's a moral to that story about perseverance and, and the illusion of, of these things. But let me take one step forward. There's the myths, but there's also the memes. And by meme, I mean the kind of phrases, the kind of watchwords, the things we tell ourselves. So in counseling psychology, one of your functions as a counselor is to provide language to your client and say, here's the way to think about, to talk about, to express these ideas, these feelings. And so these expressions are turned out to be actually important. So let me give you a few memes from different knowledge working templates. So when I worked at Park, um, we had this idea, we would invent the future. And in meeting after meeting, people would say, let's invent the future. Let's do that. Let's contribute deep ideas. Let's be the leader for computer science in the nation. And so in many ways, that actually came to be true. So that's the way we talk. So memes are not trivial things. They are funny sometimes. You'll, you've seen funny memes, right? But they can also be a deep representation of what your culture is and how the company itself thinks about itself. When I was at Apple, the meme was either insanely great or think different, depending on which regime you were in. Uh, but in both cases, we would be in meetings and say, let's be insanely great. What would insanely great be? So we came up with all these great products, right? Including some you probably not have heard about, like QuickTime 3D, which set the, 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 the floor for VR products. This is back in the 90s. When I was at IBM, of course, the famous uh, meme there was think. But the more important memes were this one, build it and they will come. I know I stole that from a movie, but it's true. You know what it's like at IBM, right? We build, IBM builds these incredibly sophisticated, large systems and then sell them to the world at scale. That's the language IBM uses to talk about the products that they make. And of course at Google, you know, we keep hearing this don't be evil thing. Um, but I think in many ways, these two are more important index all the world's information, make it available. Can't quite do that, but it's a goal. It's our moonshot. It's our meme that we talk about. And we are data driven. That leads me to my next point, which is, if you're gonna be data driven and you're a company of a lot of people, in our case, we're 100,000 or something, how do you get data about that? So those, the, the myths and the memes are something in the culture. But then in about 2008 or so, um, 2018, sorry, we did this interesting internal research project, Project Oxygen, Project Aristotle, where we started with this interesting thing. You have to know the framing, right? Google starts 1998, I joined 2005. And this was the big question at the time. If we're an engineering company, why do we need all these managers? So Larry Page did this experiment where he basically got rid of all the managers. You're gone. So the side effect of that was my uh, senior VP had 75 direct reports and my director had 40. Do you see a problem? Right. So in some ways, Google was in a young company, young and foolish. And, you know, there's this maxim about stay foolish, stay hungry. But I would add to that and don't do dumb things. Right. Uh, and hiring, firing all of your managers is not a really great move. So we figured that one out. But the important thing that came out of this was we understood that we needed to experiment on our culture. That was an experiment. Failed. So since we need managers, what do managers do? And I've given you some ideas. But in the project, what I'm going to tell you about Project Oxygen, we've had this ongoing set of experiments and studies of what works for knowledge workers inside of Google. This may apply to your company or your environment. 
your mileage may vary, right? But this is, this is what we found. The analysis here starts by looking at what the managers do and how they're scored. So we divided them in high scoring and low scoring managers, and we used five different data sources. So uh, employee comments and surveys about their managers, uh, award nominations, performance reviews of, of, of people interviews and so on. We used a lot of data. And the interesting thing about this study is that we had 85% participation. Nobody gets 85% participation on anything. So this is a huge study, very believable, very believable. So we've got all this data. So what did we find? And in some ways, this list will seem obvious to you. But if I ask you now, write down the 10 behaviors that you think make a good manager. I would be interested to see. If we had another hour, we'd do that exercise and then see the delta between what I'm going to show you versus what you write. But I'll tell you now. Um, <clears throat> and this is in rank order. This is most important. Is a good coach. A good manager is a good coach. Like, what the hell? Right? What are we, a sports team? Yeah. Well, a coach, right, does a bunch of things that managers might not. They give specific, timely, balanced feedback directly to you. A typical or a archetypical manager is somebody who dives in once a, once a quarter and says, okay, Joni, you're not doing a good job. No, 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 no. A coach is there all the time, constantly giving you feedback on your performance and ways to improve. They empower the team and don't micromanage. Again, it sounds obvious, but what empowering does is it gives direct freedom and being available for advice. You can talk to your manager about what makes your team better and don't sit in on every meeting. They create an inclusive team environment, right? So this is interesting because showing concern for success and well-being. When this report first came out, a lot of engineers went, what? I don't need no well-being. I'm an engineer. I deal in objective truth. It's like, well, you may think that, but here's the reality. People care about this kind of thing. They need to understand that, uh, that the managers are seen as fair and caring. They are perceived as that by their direct reports. Obviously being productive and results oriented. Good communicator. Good communicator? I didn't go to grad school to be a good communicator. I wanted to learn software engineering. Well, yeah, you need to do that too, okay? So what's fascinating to me about this is supporting career development, having a clear vision, having the key technical skills is number eight out of 10. So you may be the hottest programmer on your block. That gives you some technical chops, but it doesn't make you a good manager, all right? Contrary wise, it's hard to be a good manager at Google without having some technical chops, all right? But it's eight out of 10, it's not two out of 10. And then collaborates across the company because it's a big company, lots of products, lots of international stuff. Okay, so the interesting thing that comes out of that analysis is that here are the five factors that dominate in what a manager does for their people. Number one, provide psychological safety. Again, people were, were, were surprised by that. You might not be. Maybe you're a humanist. Maybe you're a, a caring person. But lots of engineers were surprised by that. Then providing structure and clarity, providing meaningful work, providing working environments where you could depend on one another to get things done. And finally, having some overall impact. Because lots of people at Google, I think, initially would have said that was number one. No, 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 no. So here's our Maslowian hierarchy of, of Googler needs <laughs> in some sense. And the base here is psychological safety. You have to feel like it's okay to come into a meeting and say, you know, that analysis you did last week, Rob, totally wrong. And know that nobody's gonna jump on me because of that. You need to feel like that. And if you don't feel like that, as we've seen from endless, endless aviation disasters, if you can't raise an objection and feel okay, then you've got problems. So this is what we end up with, is this sort of structure. And then of course we can talk about, you know, what, how do we support innovation? What do we do and all that? And these are sort of obvious in some sense, but again, these are from the reports of 80,000 people. So this is pretty interesting stuff. 
Okay, so um, that's sort of the environment, the, the managerial environment, how you get people to do your moonshotty work while feeling good enough to do the work and stick around to do it for the long term. So now I want to reflect a little bit about <clears throat> the nature of knowledge work. So what it is now and, and where it's going. And one thing to think about is if you're a knowledge worker, what do you work on? What are your, what's your, what are your tools? What's your toolkit? And of course, for me, I think for a lot of workers, knowledge workers, the stuff of work, the material of work is knowledge and information searchable. And in this case, on the intranet primarily, not the internet, we'll get to that in a second, but the internet, meaning search over your internal content, what your company is good at, right? And so you can, you might have an intranet that looks like this under some uh, projection, but ultimately it turns down, turns down into documents that you can find in your index somehow. So the question here is really, how do we go from searching that web to useful pieces of information? And you know, intranets are different than internets. What works for Google for the internet does not work for the intranet. They're structurally different. And a lot of the properties that hold there don't hold there. So the algorithms have to be different. Knowledge workers, do you have to do anything different? Probably. So we have high expectations of the ability to use a rig like this. This is a knowledge worker wrench, right? You have a large display space. You've got one over here that does nothing but code, one over here that does nothing but Gmail, one over here that does nothing but social communication stuff, work communication stuff. And I don't know what that is, but people have enough real estate so they can keep these things organized. Trying to put somebody onto a little tiny screen like this, yeah, you can do it. You spend half your life switching windows in and out. So you have to give people these things, the tools that allow them to work with knowledge. And a fundamental observation here to recognize is that um, knowledge workers spend about 40% of their time, depending on how you measure, searching for stuff. Wait a second. They spend that much of their work time searching? Yeah. They're searching through their email, through their calendar, through their online documentation, et cetera, et cetera, right? Skulls, that is the amount of material you can have in your brain at any one time, we have not gone through a major upgrade in a mega year, right? We've got a skull that only has a kind of relatively fixed capacity. It's big, but it's fixed. And yet, the knowledge changes all the time. You know what that's like. So one thing that's interesting is the value of externalized knowledge. Because with search and tools to find things, for example, you can learn new stuff. So here, this first one is how to use SAP regulatory compliance. There's a video for you. You may have forgotten since you only have to do that once a year. And so this is the way to get back to that. It includes learning enormous details. So you can search for something. This is what, uh, how to make a pivot table in Excel, because I can never remember. Um, not only do you find out, or here are the steps to do that, here are the related questions that other people ask. These are the social recommendations. Like that book? I got a good one for you here. <laughs> and you can get this stuff in amazing technical detail. So if you've ever looked at Stack Overflow, it's an incredible resource. So if you're trying to do type conversions in Python, there's the code. There's the code. Now, this leads to a really interesting phenomenon, which is what I call cargo cult programming. Right? So people copy and paste complex pieces of code and data and procedures into their tools and they hit go. Do they know what's happening? So it's a question for you. Have you ever run obscure scripts without really understanding what they're doing? Have you? Have you? We all have. <laughs> I know the rest of you are lying. <laughs> right? I've seen what happens, right? And so we're all, to some extent, cargo cult programmers. We have the form, but not the knowledge of a lot of this stuff. My favorite example is I need to use a, a thing in SED, which is a really obscure program I used to know a million years ago, to transform data from this form to that form. 
I forgot all of my said code like a million years ago. So I copy and I paste, it transforms, I'm happy. How did it work? Beats me. So we're all guilty of this. And, and yet at the same time, we're living in an environment where information streams and volume keep going up and up and up. Skulls don't scale, right? So what do you do? A, you have to live in a triage culture. You have to know how to do social filtering. You have to know how to search. You have to understand the scope and landscape of your information spaces, right? So when I was in grad school, uh, my daughter's in grad school now at Berkeley, and I told her that when I was in grad school, I had the entire literature from my field of artificial intelligence in a box under my desk. I could do that. And none of it was a PDF. It was all photocopies. Remember photocopies? I mean, we used to use Xerox as a verb. <laughs> but now we, anyway, I had the entire extant literature in a box, because that's all there was. Now, I can't even watch the videos on that sub, 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 sub field anymore. And as one of my colleagues said to me, you know, um, I can't even watch the videos of the meetings I'm supposed to have attended. So one of the things we do, one of the accommodations is change the playback rate. Does anybody do that in their video? Yeah, I do. 1.5 is my friend. I get through it in about 25% less time. So I can watch that hour meeting in, I'm really fast, say 30 minutes. Huge time savings. If you don't know this, I'll show you afterwards and it will save your life. Right? So we are living in this different world and we not only have increasing amounts of information, which is not a surprise, but we have different expectations. When did people start bringing laptops to every meeting? Do you remember that? There was a huge shift. So here is a meeting at Google a few years ago Every single person has a laptop. And if you don't have a laptop, what's wrong with you? Right? Now, I also assume we all have phones and all of its attendant capabilities. You can get instant messages, right? You can get reminders. You can get all that knowledge. It now lives on the supercomputer in your pocket. So that's an interesting shift because one of the things it does, it changes the notion of availability. If people are an important information resource in the knowledge work, their availability is deeply important to you. So we have various ways of communicating, you know, this, that, and the other thing. And we've got Slack, and we've got all these different methods of reaching out to people and discovering things. Oh, by the way, we also have bots. Bots are now part of our communication ecosystem. Okay, we'll come back to that because bots are coworkers. Right. So in bots, in my experience at work, we've got bots that, for example, enforce social niceties. That's not a very diverse phrase you're using. Why don't you use something else? Right. Okay. Um, but they also become sources of oracular knowledge. I can ask a question like, how do I do X in Python? The Python bot will pipe, pipe up and say, here you go. So bots have become this really interesting adjunct to the way we think about work. And of course, if you're going to live in an environment like that, how do you manage as a human being? Not only do you have a limited capacity skull, you have limited capacity information bandwidth. Right? I can only hit you with so many megabits per second before you stall out, before you can't handle it. So Cal Newport has this really nice book called Deep Work where he points out the deep work is a different kind of work. It's very easy in a knowledge working company to be inundated with instant messages and emails, to-do lists and all that stuff. That's not deep work. Deep work is focused time. It's spending your mental energy on a topic that you care about. So you need to shield off, mask out all those other sources of interruptions. So, what do we do? Here's one solution. Yeah, he's probably listening to music. More importantly, this is a social signal that he, this guy is engaged in deep work. Do not interrupt him, All right? So this has become a convention in most knowledge working companies I know of. If you're wearing headphones, 
Do not touch my shoulder. Do not ask me out to lunch. Leave me alone, right? So we come up with these mechanisms. We are hacking the culture effectively. So um, here are a couple of hacks that we do. Um, so Sundar has these things, these ideas called Sundar days, which are days off, right? So there's the vacation schedule, there's the usual holiday schedule, and Sundar says, that's a Sundar day. Do not show up to work, right? So he's trying to basically space out and make time for deep work. We also have this policy of now having no meeting weeks. And of course, what it really means is 90% week, no week, no meetings, right? There are some meetings you just can't turn off. That's okay, we understand. But the idea is to give you more space and time. And of course, you know, my friend Alex, Alex uh, Pong wrote this uh, book called The Shorter, which is trying to move the whole culture to a four day work week. What would that be like? So you see what's going on here is we're trying to think what can we do to be faster, but more focused. A knowledge worker requires time, focus, lack of interruptions and deep knowledge. So one of the adjunct effects of this is that things move faster, right? So a couple of years ago, this is a true story. Um, all my stories are true, but this one's especially true. Um, <laughs> We had a candidate, a PhD student. I don't remember if he's from Carolina or not. But the PhD student comes in, very proud of his work, presents his work, giving the usual job talk. Here's what I did. Here's my data set. Blah, blah. And next to me is my friend Malcolm. And Malcolm says, oh, that's really interesting. And he downloads the guy's data set because he gave the data set at the beginning. And sitting in MATLAB, because he's a MATLAB savant, is basically a fancy programming language for mathematical work. He reproduced the entire thesis within the hour. At the end, he very, very gently raises his hands. You know, I, I just redid your work, and I have a different answer. Now, he, he did this very, very, very kind way. But you see what happened. This student comes in with a huge, you know, years worth of work. We reproduce it in 50 minutes and we can talk about it. Meet work, meaningful work now happens in the context of meetings, including reproductions of entire years worth of work. This is an acceleration that James Gleick talks about in his book, Faster, right? If everything's speeding up, all of a sudden we don't get to moonshots. We don't quite get to instant tech transfer but we do get an acceleration of the pace of work. So we have to have culture hacks to work around this because I don't know if it's a policy, policy here, but one of the subtle pressures that people can put on their staff, their colleagues, is by sending emails at three in the morning on Sunday, right? You've no, I know you've never done that. But one of the culture hacks since that Im that imbues a kind of pressure because your faculty advisor is up at 3 a.m. on Sunday. Why aren't you? Right. Same thing with managers and the knowledge worker. Right? So one of the hacks is schedule on send emails. So I'm not going to. Uh, yes, I'm up at 3 a.m. on Sunday, but don't 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 worry about it. I will send it on Monday at 9 a.m. You probably get four messages all sent within one second of each other, so you'll figure it out. But you see the point? We can be conscious of this work design, this culture design, and get things done. Now, we can think about, for example, the, we have all these tools, and you can enumerate them yourself. Um, and we've got a lot of them, right? All these different you know, logos you can, you can imagine. And they're all work that we do in workplaces like this. Is this the perfect design? For doing knowledge work, well, especially now, is it more like this? So one of the things about this, this is a generic conference room at Google. Thing to note, every single conference room has a whole virtual video conferencing unit in it. That's been true basically since I joined. And it was a novelty in 2005, 2006, right? There is no video setup time because you walk in and it's already running. But the second thing that's happened during COVID is that uh, it's hard to see here, but that little logo there says that there's a bot in this room listening. So you can ask the bot in the room to do things for you. 
extend the meeting time, find a new conference room, et cetera, et cetera. So all of a sudden now we're seeing bots as part and parcel of what we're doing. Now, one thing that happened a while ago, and it's sort of, I, I was putting together a talk, I was thinking about this. When did we stop using apps all the time? Remember once upon a time, I was, in, I was working at Xerox Park at the time, and it was very clear in 95 that the world was going to shift off of native apps for everything, native apps, Uber, all this, to the browser as the universal solution, the one ring to bind them all, right? One ring to bring them all together, and one technology to make them work in the darkness. That was an interesting shift, because all of a sudden, all you needed was a netbook, a, a wireless computer without all the millions of applications installed. And that had all kinds of good side effects. And one of the things that, that happens is that, you know, when people are doing their, their knowledge work, you don't want to worry about system updates. Sorry, Gary. Yeah. You don't. So if you could have a single browser, especially one that's automatically updated by, let's say, Chromebook or one of the Microsoft um, net tablets, um, there are ways to get around this. But what's so interesting about knowledge work is that if you're trying to find interesting information, even little tiny changes in the amount of time it takes to do something, the probability of success can have huge consequences. Right? So if I don't know that I can find that information, I'm probably not even going to start. There's this really interesting set of, of work from, from, uh, from library science and from earlier work where the, the probability of accessing a book drops off as the cube of the distance from the central desk, right? It's well known. And the same thing is true in the current world, exactly the same result. So I want to end the last section here about thinking about what the future of knowledge work is. Um, we're, as I said, we're all part of this unconsented experiment now. And you know what's happening here, right? The great resignation, people are changing. And what's pretty clear, it's not going to go back the way it was. Three, year, three years ago. So when you ask people, it really is time to get beyond this remote versus office. In 2013, Marissa and I could say, no, 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 none of this remote work stuff. Now it's not an option, just not an option. People are not gonna come back to the office the way that we were even three years ago. So 68% now they do that. And what's interesting is you look at the, the, the scientific work on this, Remote workers have reported being as productive and all the measures I've seen show that that's kind of true, which is a huge surprise. I did not think that remote productivity would be as high as it is. But there are costs, some of which are implicit and hidden. So you get much fewer unscheduled encounters, right? You have a measurable loss of trust as a function of distance, which is a huge surprise. So if I'm working with a colleague, say in say North Carolina and I'm in Mountain View, California, I have less trust than if I'm working with somebody in San Diego. That is a weird but true effect. And so this loss of connectivity is a big deal. It's more important when you start thinking about the loss of weak social ties. So one of the reasons I'm really glad to be here is I never run into the streets of Palo Alto, Gary. You know, and so I'm really glad to restore some of these, what you think of as weak social ties. People I see at conferences, like Rob or Jaime, right? I only see you guys at conferences, right? Or when I'm here. So it's one of those things that is enabled by a physical co-presence. But our virtual work doesn't work out quite so well. So if you start thinking now about AI and machine learning systems, you know, here's the big thing. People keep asking me, when am I going to get an AI? I want one. <laughs> it's too late. They're already here. Right. So this is, I think, an interesting phase shift in the way knowledge work happens, is that you're not going to get an AI one day. You're not going to get a robot wheeling in. You're not going to get Rosie the robot walking in and saying, hey, I'm going to help you. Instead, you're going to start to see AI everywhere as part and parcel of things like you know, spell correction. We do spell correction. No spell correction system in the world these days works without machine learning. No map routing system in the world works without classic symbolic AI. 
search mechanism. Right? So what you're seeing are these things built in everywhere. And I think one of the more surprising things to me has been the rise of AI systems in co-writing or writing alone. So it may surprise you that about 10% of all high school sports stories in newspapers in the US are written automatically. No human was ever involved. Somebody sends in the scores and the story is generated. Uh, about, and this is really surprising, about a, a third of Bloomberg news posts. Bloomberg? Yeah, they're automatically written. And you can see where this is going. You can see where this is going. So what's even more surprising though is if you can write English text, if a bot can write English text, could it write SQL? Ah, if, for those who are interested, there's the GitHub repository you can go download the code right now and try it, which is part of that acceleration. Because now we can have bots that can do what I would have thought of as skilled knowledge laborer now being done automatically. You start with a description of the data sets, the databases, and write in the English uh, natural language, and it generates XQL. So you can see where this is going, right? You probably have heard about Jill Watson which is an online virtual um, graduate student assistant. There is no human involved here. But Jill answers lots of questions for Shark Goel's classes. Sort of handles all that sort of everyday question answering stuff. So <clears throat> this is an interesting time. Interesting time because the bots will become more capable. They'll become more integrated because You've probably seen websites now. I'm trying to buy a faucet, and some bot wakes up and says, Hey, can I help you choose a faucet? No, go away. Right? Um, but for people for, where, for whom bots can actually genuinely add value, like helping me walk through a differential set of cancer diagnoses and prescriptions, that can be really useful, particularly if I'm not highly medical literate. So, one of the things that's happening is that we are using AI even in ways you don't even know about. So one of the systems we have um, is a system called Duplex, which will, if you're talking on the phone, I call my bank and I call that bank, this will pop up once you enter the voice tree. Once you enter hold, my phone says, uh, I can wait, I can put, on, put you on hold. Wait, 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 what? Yeah, you remember admins? would be on hold for you, you, senior executive, right? You would have an admin who would then call the bank and then say, okay, Gary, I'll let you know when they come to, to the phone to pump. Well, I have a bot that does that. And it's built into my phone. And last example here is um, one of the things we're using a, this system for is to have conversations with people. So as you probably know, we have a decent speech generation system and a decent speech record system. Well, it's not hard to write a little bot that would then call a restaurant and find out what hours are you open. So we do this a lot. We do, I think it's a 100,000 a week kind of thing, where the bot calls restaurants and shops to get the latest information. So when you go to Google and say, open hours for the root seller, the reason we know is because this system called the root seller last week and asked somebody, because we don't trust them to enter the data correctly into the web forms, right? So we actually have this, and let me play you 30 seconds of this, just so you can understand what it sounds like. This is somebody calling to make a, an appointment. What happened out here? Hi, I'm calling to the Holy Care Fact for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. This is the bot. Human. Bot. Mm -hmm. Human. The laughter is the audience. For a while? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 115. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's your first name? The first name is Lisa. 
Okay, perfect. So I will see you at 10 o'clock on May So 3rd. you see what's happening here? Great, great. Have a great day. Back. The bot is not only speaking in a pretty natural voice and understanding pretty disfluent language, because that's what we speak. It's also adding its own ums and ahs and hesitations to give it this sort of flexible, comfortable feeling. So let me, let me wrap up last minute here. Um, I, I tried to give you a, a picture of you know, where the knowledge work world is. Told you a little bit about our experiments with Project Oxygen and what factors we find important for making knowledge workers happy and productive and, and stick around. And talk a little bit about sort of some of these background issues. The sociology of, of big companies, of knowledge working companies, how they think about themselves in terms of memes, and what the future of knowledge work is. Because it's not a surprise, the future of knowledge work is going to be, it's going to be faster. There's going to be more of it. It's going to be inherently collaborative. And there's going to be lots and lots of bots in our system. They will take on many, many different forms, different styles, different ways. But there's not going to be one bot. There's going to be many of them. And so our, collab our notion of collaboration extends not just to our virtual partners in video space somewhere, in high video space, but also to bot space, which are inherently virtual. Whether or not they will be 3D avatars, I don't know. It doesn't matter. What does matter is that we accommodate in our culture this new way of doing knowledge work. Thanks.